This morning, Dallas City Council getting aggressive on recruiting new businesses, tired of letting them land in the suburbs. Councilman Tanell Atkins on what's now underway at Dallas City Hall. San Antonio looking ahead to a big economic comeback. Mayor Ron Nirenberg on exactly when he expects tourism and conventions to return to pre-pandemic levels and what that means to the city budget until then. Lawmakers from across the country are calling on the U.S. Senate to delay their winter recess until they finish one piece of business. State Rep. Trey Martinez-Fisher leading on this one and will be on our program. And some interesting names added to Texas ballots at the last minute. But will the primaries actually happen on March 1st? Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley starts now. Good Sunday morning to our viewers across the state. We appreciate you being here this holiday week. Let's get right to the top political headlines across Texas. The candidate filing deadline has passed and primary ballots are being finalized. And there is a new Republican candidate for Texas governor. It's Rick Perry, not the former governor Rick Perry, but another Rick Perry from Springtown, just northwest of Fort Worth, clearly recruited to create a little bit of confusion on the ballot. In Dallas County, voters might see a rematch for district attorney. Three years ago, John Cruzeau there defeated Faith Johnson to become Dallas's top prosecutor. Johnson now says she is running for the seat again. She is a Republican, Cruzeau a Democrat. Both are former judges, but Cruzeau will first face fellow Democrat, former judge Elizabeth Frizzell in the primary. And a Texas mayor could be facing some trouble. Ray Smith is the Prosper, uh, the mayor of Prosper in Collin County. Police say that he left the scene of an accident that left a motorcyclist seriously injured. Mayor Smith says he did not realize anyone was hurt. Investigators are turning it over to a grand jury to decide whether to pursue any charges. As we start this holiday week, 200 state lawmakers from across the country were asking the U.S. Senate not to take a break, not until they take up voting rights bills that would prevent discrimination at the polling booth. The House has passed this legislation, but the Senate just doesn't have the votes to do so. A Texas lawmaker is leading this effort. State Rep. Trey Martinez Fisher, a Democrat from San Antonio. Representative, it's good to see you again. Let's talk about this this uh, effort that you've been leading. More than 200 lawmakers, Democratic lawmakers from across the country signed on to this letter calling for a delay in winter recess for Senate Democrats so they can pass voting rights. Has anyone responded to you all yet? Texas Democrats have been very bold on this issue. Uh, we find ourselves in the center of the conversation across the country. And, and this letter, uh, led by, by myself and my office, uh, gathered 200 signatures from 41 states plus Guam, uh, telling the U.S. Senate, don't go home without giving us voting rights. Uh, yeah, uh, this is a very fluid conversation. In, in very you know, recent uh, last couple of days, we all realized that Build Back Better is now sort of moving to the sideline as Senators... Uh, Senators Manchin and, and the White House negotiate the finer points. And so you now see a opportunity to maybe put voting rights back in front. You've been to D.C. before. We were with you in D.C. when the uh, House Democrats took off up there. You just got back from D.C. before this interview here. Are you just getting paid lip service, do you think? Or are they actually working behind the scenes to make something happen? You know, th that's a good question. I, I, I think um, what I'm beginning to realize is Things move very, very slow in Washington. So, look, I, I know the inside game in Austin. I, you know, legislate behind the scenes, and I know sometimes it takes a while. But in Washington, I mean, they, they have this manana mentality where everything's going to get done tomorrow. Uh, and so, listen, when, when we visit with them, uh, they're very concerned about things that are happening in Texas. Uh, you, you know, in, in our visits, you know, going back to our visits with Senator Manchin, when you compare how you vote, in West Virginia to how you vote in Texas, it's much different. And I'll give you an example. In West Virginia, if you're a shift worker, if you're a nurse or a firefighter, you get to vote by mail. We don't get to do that in Texas. In West Virginia, if you're afraid to go stand in line at the polls uh, because of COVID, you get to vote by mail. You can't do that in Texas. In West Virginia, if you have a DWI and you're sitting in the county jail, you get to vote by mail. You can't do that in Texas. And, and so when we explain to these senators just how high the hurdles are in the state of Texas to vote, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, they want to make a change. But as, you know, I said earlier, things don't move very fast in Washington. I wish they did. Uh, you know, I wish we, we had, you know, more momentum 
but we're not going to give up because, you know, our democracy is too important. We're going to continue to fight as long as people are willing there to, to, to hear us out. You mentioned West Virginia, obviously, which is where Senator Joe Manchin is from. Is it the fact that he doesn't see the urgency on this for the reasons you just stated? Or is this all about reelection? And he's concerned about reelection. Kirsten Sinema is concerned about reelection in Arizona. Is that what it's about? I, you know, I don't think it it, it, it really shouldn't be. I, I think what, what it ought to be about is that, you know, I imagine Senator Manchin enjoys being in the Democratic majority in the Senate. I'm sure Senator Manchin enjoys being a chairman of a committee. Uh, those things go away when you lose the majority in the Senate and with some very tough races in Georgia, uh, you know, a tough race in Arizona, uh, you know, Senate Democrats could lose the majority. Uh, and, and there are some much needed democracy reforms that would go a long way in a state like Georgia that could help Senator Warnock or Senator Ossoff, uh, you know, maintain their incumbency. So I think that's what goes through their heads. What I believe they keep saying is they're, they're a little you know, reluctant to, to change the rules reform. And I think that there are some very serious discussions on, on how you might make a rules change to take the Senate back to its traditional, uh, uh, you know, history where you actually had to get on your feet and hold the floor and speak while you filibuster. These days, these folks do it with a, with a text message. They just make a threat to filibuster and everything comes to a stop. That's not the way it was, uh, you know, back in, in the old days. And I think the Senate's trying to find a way to get there. Gotcha. Representative Trey Martinez-Fisher, good to see you again. We appreciate the time. Thank you for having me, man. Let's talk about next year's primary election for a moment here and pose a question everyone is asking. Will the election be delayed beyond March 1st? Democrats in the Department of Justice are suing over the newly drawn districts in Texas, saying Republicans reduce the influence of minorities. So what will judges do? One of the people we ask questions like this to is Ross Ramsey co-founder and executive editor of the Texas Tribune. He is in Austin, as always. Ross, good morning. Good morning, Jason. How are you? Uh, doing well here. You know, the, the big question going into the new year here is whether a judge might delay the March primaries while courts sort out the redistricting. How likely is that to happen? You know, it's happened before. I don't know how likely I would rate it. You know, my crystal ball was broken several years ago, but um, <laughs> the candidates have all filed and the new redistricting maps are in court. And if the courts find any problem with those, They'll delay at least part of the election in some races just to redraw the maps. The question is whether the maps are legal or not, and we won't know that until the judges say so. Likely next month, hopefully. Who knows, though? You know, California wants to go after assault rifles and those homemade guns called ghost guns using the same mechanism that Texas used for the abortion law, where the state doesn't enforce it, but individuals enforce it by suing over this. Just, just curious, how likely is that to survive, and what might it mean to Texas's abortion law? Well, the Supreme Court hasn't knocked this down yet. They're a little bit stumped on it, it looks like. The provision lets people, as you say, file lawsuits to enforce the law. If that works on what has been a constitutionally protected right like abortion, other states are looking at it and saying, well, maybe it could work for guns. Maybe it could work for uh, people burning coal. Maybe it could work for some of these other things that we're challenging. We'll have to see what the Supremes do. And we'll, we'll wait and see that in the new year. Ross, back to you in a moment. Thank you. Coming up, San Antonio looking for a big economic comeback. Mayor Ron Nirenberg on when he is thinking that conventions and tourism might return to pre-pandemic levels. Dallas City Hall has a new plan to land big business, trying to play catch up in a sense with other Texas cities and the suburbs. Councilman Tanel Atkins joins us in a moment. And if you're on the road for the holidays, take along our podcast. It's called Yolitics. New content, fresh interviews, an entire library of episodes on Texas politics is waiting for you. Plus, new ones drop every Tuesday wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Inside Texas Politics. To San Antonio now, as it is looking ahead to a big economic comeback. 300 conventions have canceled there since the pandemic began. These are major money makers for the city. So when might they return? And is the loss of tax revenue hurting the city's bottom line? Those are among the questions we had for the mayor, Ron Nirenberg. Mayor Nirenberg, welcome back to our program. Look, let's look back at 2021 here for a moment. You won re-election. We had the February freeze. The vaccine became available. Then we had the Delta variant, now the Omicron variant. Which one was the most challenging for you of, of all these? What was the most challenging over the last 12 months? It has to be the Delta surge that really... Uh, no one anticipated the depth of it challenged our medical system. 
even more than it did in 2020. And the, the impact that it had in prolonging, prolonging the economic hardship uh, was significant and continues to reverberate. So the, the Delta surge definitely was the unfortunate uh, highlight, low light of 2021 for us. Mayor, I was in San Antonio about uh, two weeks ago, and, and I noticed along the Riverwalk, tourists are returning, it seems like, but conventions clearly are not. I think I read that uh, San Antonio is down with 300 conventions that have canceled since the pandemic began. Uh, the Omicron variant is, is probably going to muddy up some plans for some people, but how many years do you think it's going to take for conventions to return to your city like pre-pandemic levels? To get to pre-pandemic levels, the 2019 levels, our hospitality and tourism industry and our own internal folks are projecting good case scenario, two to three years uh, in our uh, more conservative scenarios, maybe five years to get to those 2019 levels again. Mayor, conventions likely will not pick up until air travel picks up. And we were actually right. in San Antonio talking to the CEO of Southwest Airlines, Gary Kelly, for our podcast. And he said that air travel is not going to pick up until people return to the office. Are you pushing for people to return to the office to kind of get the whole cycle going again? We are pushing uh, to make sure that people have the information. And with the information, they can feel conf uh, confident that we have the tools in place to get back to, to some of uh, the normalcy that we experienced before, getting back to the office, getting back to business. We can do that if we are smart about it and we use the tools available to us. So we are seeing offices return. We're seeing people go back to work in person, and we have uh, the ability to do so. Uh, I will say San Antonio's air travel has picked up a, a little bit faster pace than most. Uh, we've had uh, some very good months, uh, and, and those trend lines continue at San Antonio International. Of course, we have a lot of visitor traffic as well that is not just purely um, dependent on those business scenarios. But uh, again, our, our mantra here is we have the ability, we have the tools, we have the experience to deal with um, what is left of the pandemic, as long as we're smart. With, without conventions and pre-pandemic levels that you had there in San Antonio, uh, the city cannot collect taxes from hotel rooms, from rental cars, from Uber drivers, et cetera. It's, it's the whole economic chain there. Is San Antonio expecting to live on a pretty lean budget for the next few years until these conventions come back? You know, I think there's a lot of different factors in that. And certainly the loss of con the impact of the convention and, and uh, conference industry has been impactful and has residual impacts. But what we're seeing in terms of business picking up in those areas downtown, even in our convention center and in the restaurants and hotels in and around the downtown area, it's quite uh, active now, and our sales tax figures have been robust, in fact, have beaten our forecast. So uh, we think that some of those forecasts, the more pessimistic scenarios in terms of impact to our revenues and impact to the industry and business are just that. They're a bit pessimistic. We expect business and, and life to return a little bit faster than what we were predicting in 2020 and even into 2021. Good luck in the new year. Good to see you again. Merry Christmas. You too. Thanks so much, Jason. Texas's population has exploded over the last decade. Businesses relocating to the state have led to booms in cities and in suburbs. And in North Texas, Dallas is now trying to position itself better to land some of these new companies. Councilman Tanel Atkins chairs the city's Econo economic development committee and said Dallas is kind of playing catch up to other places across the state. Councilman Atkins, welcome back to our program. We appreciate you being here. Uh, Dallas is launching an economic development corporation. The city of Dallas already has an economic development department. What can the new entity do that the department at the city cannot? Well, you know, first I want to say Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to WFAA. Uh, I, I believe there are another tool in the toolbox. You cannot have too many tools in the toolbox, but I think this is a great tool to have. Uh, we are the ninth largest city in America. We're not an economic dollar corporation. Other cities do have this too. And this too, we specialized to make a corporation uh, uh, pinpoint to Dallas, not the region. We got to think about Dallas one. You mentioned that other Texas cities have these and other cities across the country have these. Did Dallas see that it was missing out on something and, and needed to get this tool in the toolbox? 
Yes, I believe because right now, you know, we are, Dallas got two um, airport DFW little field, we're central located, and we got more people moving from the East Coast, West Coast, here to city Dallas. We need every tool that we need to put in the toolbox to make sure we're on the same level playing field throughout America. And this tool is a great tool because we would be able to buy land, hold land, to be able to deal directly to corporation faster than the city of Dallas, but it's still going to have an oversight by the other city council. We, you mentioned that, the, you know, kind of a Dallas first mentality, because there are a lot of businesses that focus on uh, the DFW area, the Metroplex as a whole. But we have watched Dallas lose out like on uh, the Amazon HQ2 a year or two ago. Um, the same thing with Uber. It, it opened the big offices there on the uh, east side of the skyline and it scaled back everything likely, you know, probably because of the pandemic and maybe for some other reasons as well. But, but what, what's it going to take for Dallas to land one of these massive corporations to add to the portfolio that's already here? I think we're doing something once that we have not done before. Um, DISD, Dallas Penn School District, you know, the schools are getting more strong with public school. They look at public school. Uh, we look at infrastructure uh, with the federal government, with, uh, with the bill coming in, with um, putting more money into sensor track, you know, unserved area. We put more money in there in transportation. So right now, I think Dallas is gearing up with this pandemic. It's kind of woke, woke up, waking up our eyes to see we got to move faster. Uh, job training, you know, work, work, ed, work ed, ed, education, uh, also to make sure we job ready. And right now, we don't learn with Amazon and, and other, other companies trying to come to say that we don't learn that is another way that we were not prepared. But now we are getting prepared. And I think we will be prepared in, uh, in 2022. All right, Councilman Atkins, good to see you again. Uh, Merry Christmas to you. Same to you. Thank you very much. Bye. Coming up, Rick Perry running for governor. Not the former governor, Rick Perry, but another guy with the same name. What's the point? And more importantly, will this work? We'll begin there next on The Roundtable. This is Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley. Time now for Reporters Roundtable to put the headlines in perspective. Ross Ramsey is back with us from the Texas Tribune in Austin. Bud Kennedy is here from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. And Bernadine Steptoe joins us each week. She is the political producer at WFAA in Dallas. Ross, we'll start with you and Rick Perry running for governor. Not the former Governor Rick Perry, but a guy in, from Springtown, Texas. How likely is this to create confusion on the ballot? And how likely might he pull any votes away from the other names on there? Well, these guys are identical on the ballot. The test is going to be whether the voters are smart about who they're voting for. If you go in there unawares and you've got the slightest problem with Greg Abbott, you might turn to Rick Perry, your former governor. If the Abbott campaign can educate voters, uh, if they can figure out how to do that, they'll be trying to do that before March 1st. Indeed so. But who's behind this? Well, you know, the people behind it are obviously the people who want to force you into a runoff with Don Huffines or Alan West but it could backfire. I mean, if you spend two months saying don't vote for Rick Perry, more people vote for him, and he might be the one in the runoff over Wester Huffa. And Bernadine, with another name on the Republican ballot for governor, how likely is it now that, that uh, Governor Abbott could go into a runoff? Does that even seem plausible? I don't know if it's plausible, but in politics, anything can happen. And look at Jim Wright. You know, he's a railroad commissioner and he beat out uh, an incumbent. So I don't think that uh, Abbott is going to take it lightly, but I just don't see how it's going to take enough votes. But Abbott cannot take it lightly. And Ross, there was some some tough news, bad news for, for Greg Abbott too the other day we saw in the headlines. A, uh, a court said that he essentially cannot unilaterally prosecute cases of voter fraud, which he had been doing, which is very popular with the Republican base. Why not? What's going on here? Well, they said that uh, the attorney general can't just jump into these things with prosecutorial authority like Ken Paxton has been doing. And, you know, the attorney general looks like he's going to appeal this. But for now, that keeps him out of the election fraud business, which has been, you know, one of the main things he's been talking about for the last couple of years. It, 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 he has been talking about this, Bud. And, you know, just curious, does any of this play in the, in the primary election, which is, you know, what, 90 something days away? Well, of course, uh, Paxton's been talking about it, but he hasn't really done a lot. There haven't been a lot of cases actually filed out of the AG's office that have amounted to much. But uh, but he, he wants to be able to prosecute voter fraud, particularly in the future. Uh, the Court of Criminal Appeals turned out to be the conservatives on this. They said, no, you can't do that. It's not in the Constitution. 
And that's a good point, Bernadine. This is an all GOP panel uh, that decided this, the, 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 the judicial panel that decided this. Well, and it also shows that they're going to honor the Constitution and that you just can't go make up your own laws and do what you want to do. And I think that's what they're telling Paxton. So you can't do it, so we're not going to allow you to do it. And Ross, and, uh, I'm sorry, Bernadine, go ahead. No, no, I just think that he is disappointed because, you know, he, he finds glee in uh, prosecuting voter fraud. Yeah, the, the, the few cases there actually are that the... Uh, that are out there in the state. But but if he, the, the state constitution pretty clearly lays this out and has been laid out pretty clear, Ross, since what, the, the end of the Civil War, I believe. D does he have really an appeal? Well, I, you know, not really. I mean, he can ask them for a rehearing. I think it's significant that a nine member, all Republican court said, look, there's nothing in for you here. Um, he's just gonna have to figure another way forward. Bud, final thoughts on this. Well, he's a, he's a civil lawyer. He's not a prosecutor. Uh, the DAs are the chief prosecutors in Texas, and the AG can't pretend to be one. Yeah, and, and that, that's the thing too, Bernadine. People may not realize, some states, the, the attorney general can go off of crim criminal cases, not in Texas, though. Well, and also, he immediately started blaming blue states, I mean, blue counties, saying that they're going to allow voter fraud. Yeah. Um, so that's going to be another talking point for some of the Republicans. But I think that it takes a lot out of uh, Ken Paxton. We shall see. Guys, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you for joining us as well. We're back again next Sunday during the holidays here to take you inside Texas politics and hope you can join us. Until we see you then, take care.